Halfway to 100, episode 50. Let's do this. This is the business of architecture. Helping architects conquer the world. And here's your host, Enoch Sears. Welcome back, Architect Nation. This is Enoch Bartlett Sears, and this is the show where we talk about what they didn't teach us in school, how to run a great business. Today's segment is our second interview with Steve L. Wintner, AIA Emeritus. He's the founder and principal of Management Consulting Services, a professional consulting firm located in the Austin, Texas area, and focused on the productivity and profitability of professional design firms. He's the co-author of the book, Financial Management for Design Professionals, The Path to Profitability, which, by the way, if you remember in my first episode, Osha Wilson talked about this book and recommended it as a necessary book if you're planning on moving into a management position or running your own firm. Now, this is a a scripted re-record of our previous interview, and we've gone through it and and, uh, provided what I think is going to be a very valuable interview, so I'm really looking forward to this. So Steve is currently working on a new and updated version of this book with his co-author, Michael Tardiff, and I wanted to welcome Mr. Wintner back to the show. Hi, Enoch. Thanks. Absolutely. It is great to have you back, and I personally enjoyed our conversation last week. I could tell that you have a very, very deep knowledge of the business side of architecture, and it fits in perfectly with what we're trying to do here on this program, which is spread that information and make sure that people have the resources, primarily architects, and the knowledge they need to make the correct decisions that can, as a whole, help architects be more prolific, flourish, and create better designs. So thank you for what you're doing and what you've devoted your life to. Well, thank you. That's very kind of you. Well, I mean it. It's true. And last week, just to give a summary, we talked a little bit about some of the common management problems or, I guess, deficiencies that happen in architectural firms. And, Steve, we talked about your suggestions for how things can be improved. We had a great conversation about an employee retention policy, how to retain and keep the best talent, And, of course, that is a big investment. We talked about communicating and accountability within firms. And now, Steve, I know that you're working on two books now. Sounds like a lot. You're working on the rewrite for your book, Financial Management for Design Professionals, The Path to Profitability, and then also another book about the culture of accountability in professional design firms. Can you tell us quickly about those two books? Well, yes. Uh, As I mentioned last week, the first book, it was published in 2006. Now that Michael Tart, my co-author, and I, have the copyright ownership of the book, we're doing a rewrite to publish it electronically as an e-book or a Kindle book or whatever forms we might find in the electronic digital media. And that will be out sometime later this year. It's really nothing more than taking the book and enhancing what was already published. We're finding things that needed to be clarified further, expanded a little bit further. We're finding things that needed to be added that weren't in there that would be more helpful in expanding the things that we're talking about that weren't mentioned in the first place, and perhaps shortening some of the things that were ne- weren't nearly as important. So it's basically a cleanup and a better version of the first printing without making wholesale changes to it. The accountability book is something that I am just beginning in the process of developing. I'm going to work again with my co-author, Michael Tardiff, We agree that we'll work together in developing it as we did our first book because we had such a successful successful process working this out and doing the things that we've done to create the book. So we enjoyed the process, and it's been beneficial to both of us, and it's rewarded us as handsomely. So we're going to do that again, but it's going to take a lot of data gathering and understanding and trying to pull together the things that I think will be beneficial in including in a book that I really don't know if there's anything out there in the marketplace that specifically addresses that subject relative to our profession. I haven't run across anything like that, and it sounds like an absolutely wonderful asset. It's going to be another a great contribution to the library of business of architecture. So last week, we did talk a little bit about time management, and I was impressed, Steve, to be honest, uh, the first time I talked to you, normally I do these video interviews, I record them with, with Skype, and we put them on YouTube pe- so people can see the video as well. And you just explained that, you know what, that's a newer technology, uh, you expressed how your time is valuable to you, and you didn't necessarily see the time value in learning a new technology. And I thought that's a very interesting philosophy about how you personally approach your time. Can you tell me a little bit about how you do that, what suggestions do you have for managing time more efficiently? And maybe some insight to how you personally have decided to manage your time and make priorities. Sure. 
I think last week when we talked about this in some respects, uh, I touched on the area of understanding how to best to utilize a person's time in the sense of giving them the information they need, clarifying for them what they need to know about their actual day-to-day -day work. In other words, what are you going to do now? How are you going to, not what, in other words, uh, excuse me, what are you going to do, not how are you going to do what you're going to do, but what are you going to do and what are the results that are expected for what you do? How would you properly and effectively function within that role that you're particularly working on in that particular time? I refer to small firms who have less of the kind of luxury of having one thing to do, one project to work on, and not being able to keep themselves focused on a single target. Whereas in small firms, you have to do a myriad of number of things. The owners themselves, the principals themselves, wear a multitude of hats because of the size of the firm. There's a lot to be done in running such the running of such an operation. And so clarifying each of the positions and what's expected of them, the description of that position, the description of each role and its responsibilities, then specific to the project, what is the project goal, what are the fee budgets, what are the outcomes that we're striving for, what are the scheduling limitations that we have, all those things become a part of it. The best way you can do that is to understand what is expected of you. Then just focus on doing that and only do which is is expected of you and that which only you can do. If you have the luxury of being able to delegate to someone else, which in small firms there's precious little time for or the ability to do that, then it's best to go ahead and delegate. I did refer to Stephen Covey's book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, and his outline of what is best, what his best way to delegate. And from his perspective, there's only two methods on how to properly delegate, to effective delegate so that it's carried out and it's done in an effective and efficient way. Yes, in Covey's book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, there are two forms of delegation. And what are those two forms of delegation? Well, as I mentioned last week, one's called stewardship delegation, which is an environment in which you delegate to somebody, the right person, the absolute best optimum person to do that job, that's available to do that job, and then give them all the information they need to succeed to carry out what's expected of them, to accomplish the task at the best possible level as efficiently as they, and effectively as they possibly can. Give them everything, support, information, resources, everything that's needed. The other one is go for delegation, which says, I'm going to give you this to do, and then when you're done, come back and ask me what to do next. Now you can do this. Now you can do this. Now you can go do this. Now do this. That's a waste of time. That's inefficient, and it's very expensive method of operating, and yet it happens because some people just don't properly understand the art of delegation. It truly is an art. So Covey explains all of that, and he does a great job of doing that. So nothing that I could ever say about it could ever be improved upon from his perspective, in my opinion. Mm. For that, we can always refer people to Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, and that's a very easy to get a hold of, unlike your book, Financial Management for Design Professionals. Yep. So, Steve, this is the moment that everyone has been waiting for, Financial Management for Design Professionals. We're going to talk about some of the key things that firm owners or principals or people who are thinking about starting their own firms can do to increase their profitability and make the most of the existing money that's already coming into their firm. So let's get down to the basics. How should a new firm owner, or anyone for that matter, let, let's talk about computing the hourly rate. This is a question that many architects, uh, new architects have, especially people starting the firm. How does an architect, should an architect go about figuring out what they're worth? How do they figure out how much to charge for their time? Okay. Well, it, it's part of a linear process. So it's not just something that stands alone. It requires information that a firm may or may not have. Some of this information is readily available. Some may not be because of the way the firm's accounting system gathers and stores information. It might depend on the way your financial management system is set up or the way your chart of accounts is organized or how the profit loss statement is formatted. So some of these terms may not, some of these items may not be readily available. There are five components that are a part of an hourly billing rate. The first one is the hourly labor rate. The second one is the payroll benefit expenses. The third is the general and administrative expenses. The fourth is the break-even rate. And the fifth is the profit target. These are the five components that you'll need to identify, understand, and know how to apply them to develop an hourly billing rate. 
The first component relates to the cost of an employee's hourly labor based on their annual salary. For example, if you pay the employee an annual salary of $50,000, that calculates to an hourly rate of $24.04. So that's the hourly labor cost for that employee, and for the sake of calculating the hourly labor rate, the labor cost is represented as a multiple of 1.00. The second component relates to the cost of a firm's payroll benefit expenses, which includes the firm's mandatory and customary payroll deductions as a percentage of direct labor. These expenses include FICA, which is Social Security, FUDA, which is the uh, federal unemployment tax, and SUDA, which is the, the state unemployment tax. Workers' compensation and other non-discretionary benefits like major medical insurance. These expenses are represented as a multiple of direct labor somewhere in the 0.30 to 0.35 range. The third component relates to a firm's net overhead expense costs. This will include all of the indirect expenses, again, as a multiple of direct labor, somewhere in the 0.90 to 0.115 range. I'm sorry, 1.15 range. To determine the firm's total overhead expense rate, you add the multiples for the mandatory and customary payroll benefit expenses and the net overhead expenses. This total will be in the range of 1.20, which is taking the 0.30 and the, adding it to the 0.90, or up to 1.50, which will be taking the 0.35 and adding it to the 1.15 as a multiple of direct labor. Some firms have a higher, over rate, higher overhead rate, and some firms have a lower overhead rate, depending on how well they manage their overhead expenses. If you don't know how to properly calculate these components, you can't possibly do this exercise. And if you don't have the right information to calculate these components, you're going to get mis misleading information, which could lead to problems. All right, if you add the first three multiples together, you would have 1.00 for the labor rate, 0.35 for the payroll benefit expenses, and 1.20 for the net overhead expenses. This will equal a total of 1.55 as the overhead rate. Adding to the overhead rate and the labor rate equals a total of 2.55. So you take the 1.55 and you just add the labor rate of 1.00 and you get 2.55, which is the break-even rate. Yes. Now, that break-even rate tells you that this is the cost for every dollar you spend in salary for an employee was going to cost me $2.55 just to have them be here and pay them a dollar of salary every hour. So obviously, to make a profit, you have to make more than a multiple of 2.55, right? Yep. Okay, well, the next step is to calculate how much profit each hourly billing rate will include. You can actually control the amount of profit that is included in the fee at the start of any project, and this is something that it some of my colleagues are just not aware of and they have absolute that they do have absolute control over in the negotiation of a project fee. Now this does not ensure that the amount of profit will have been made at the completion of the project. It's just the targeted amount when they begin the project and set their fees because they can target a percentage of profit that gets built into the billing rate for each hour that helps to establish a project fee budget. In my opinion, I believe that anything less than a 20% profit is unacceptable. We've all spent too many years and dollars on our professional education in becoming experienced and learning what we had to do to get to that place where we are and not make at least a 20% profit for our work. That's a reasonable return on our investment in our firms. So anybody can make, so anybody that makes less than 20%, I say, you can improve upon that performance. There's room for improvement. There are some firms that will make a lot more than 20%, but the preponderance of firms don't make anywhere near that. That's a well-established statistic according to the professional surveys. And generally, what kind of profit uh, do architecture firms make? Well, you can't say that. I can only tell you that AIA surveys over the years have continued to show an improvement. That has a lot to do with the new technologies that have made things much more efficient and, and effective in doing the things that need to be done. Yep. So through technology, 
the overhead rate, has, which used to be higher, if a firm had a total overhead rate of 1.50 to 1.75, then it was in the range of being where it needed to be to be able to be competitive in the marketplace and make a profit. But now the overhead rate has dropped down to somewhere between 1.20 and 1.50. I think that it's even lower than 1.20 for some firms. Some firms have a lower overhead, which increases their profits. Some firms are better managers of their overhead expenses, and that's the key to this thing. So I say 20% is what you really need to have as a targeted profit margin. Now, here's what happens. This is the interesting thing that's not known by so many of my colleagues, except those that have gone to my workshop or have read the book, and that is you don't develop a profit of 20% by taking your 2.55 break-even or your uh, or 255 percent and multiplying it by 20 percent that will not give you a 20 percent profit that will give you a billing rate that has a 20 percent markup built into it but it's not 20 percent of your billing rate it's approximately 16.67 percent so in order to get the billing rate to have a 20% profit, you must divide the 2.55 break-even rate by the complement of the targeted profit amount. So for a target of 20% profit, you would divide by you divide the 2.55 by 8, 80% or 0. 0.80. Have I lost you yet? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> no, just kidding. I'm, I'm taking notes, but I'm waiting for you to bring it home. Okay, well... I'm just using this as an example. If you had a break-even rate of 2.55 and you divided it by 0.8, which is 80%, you'll come up with an answer of 3.1875. 3 yes. Okay, that's a multiple of your billing rate. Yes. So for every dollar of labor you spend for the salary of an employee, you need to have a billing rate that's equal to 3.1875 to make a 20% profit. Perfect sense. Okay. On a $10 an hour employee, their billing rate would be $31.88. That would guarantee you starting out with a 20% profit, whereas if you just multiplied the 2.55 by 20, you'll have eliminated almost 16% of the pro potential 20% profit when you do the math wrong. Got it. Yep. So that's the best place to start, and it's the best place to do it. But you can understand that if you don't know how to develop your overhead rate, none of this will work. The only thing that you absolutely know without a shadow of a doubt is how much you pay your people. You may be able to figure out how much you pay in payroll benefits, but if you don't know that, your true direct labor amount, or what your true direct labor amount is, then you don't know what the right multiple would be. Mm -hmm. So all of these things are pieces that go into this oversized puzzle, if you will. If you will. And that, that creates this environment of a financial management system. They all work to complement each other. They all work to feed in onto each other and to help the next thing to become known, to become developed, to become a process of bringing forth the information that's needed to make some of these good business decisions. Excellent. Well, let's move on. Let's talk about financial planning, Steve. Okay. Steve, say we're looking at the year ahead. So we figured out our billing rate, and that makes perfect sense. I get why multiplying it by 20% does not give you the full potential profit. If you think about it in a kind of elementary math, you're looking at it as a part of the whole. So you've, you have to divide by 80% because 80% is the part. So it's interesting math that once you look at the difference, the way you do it, um, one way versus the other. So very, very interesting. So here we are. We're planning for the future. We have an idea of we, we may maybe have some past records of how our firm is doing. But what do these firms need to think about when they're looking ahead and they're making either their annual profit plan or what other planning document they should be looking at? Well, again, you're not going to have any idea what the statistical data shows, and I don't even know if it exists as a statistic. How many architectural or professional design firms actually do an annual budget every year, and how many people even know how to do a profit plan to help build that annual budget? So there's a level of missing information. There's a level of not being engaged in a process that can be helpful in becoming more profitable, more effective, more efficient. Doing an annual budget is a no-brainer for me because it becomes the baseline for how you measure your performance during the course of the year. If you don't do a budget to go by, you'll never know whether you're doing well or doing poorly in, in respect to what your budget is. That makes sense, right? Yeah, absolutely. 
So as Confucius said, if you don't know where you're going, you can only end up where you're headed. To me, doing an annual budget is something that you start to do at the end of the year for the next year. So at the end of each year, you want to start working on the budget for the next year. So we're talking about an annual budget. What steps go into forming an annual budget for an architecture firm? Well, it has a lot to do with the firm itself. As I said in the outset of my conversation last week, every firm is unique. So it depends on that firm. How long have they been in business? Is it a brand new startup? Well, if they are, they have no data to go by to create a budget. They have no idea. It's all a guess. It's going to be just a swag at the best. Yeah. Most times it's going to be something that they just grabbed out of the air and it's not going to be worth very much, but that's okay. You have to start somewhere and it's better than not doing anything. If they're a firm that has some kind of a history, a historical background, I don't care how good or bad that is. I don't care how correct or incorrect it might be. Whatever their process has been, it's something to build on. So I suggest you start with at least the past three years of historical data about your finances for each of the past three years. How did you do in each of these categories that are going to be part of this budget? For me, you have to begin with the thing that means the most to the firm, which is the lifeblood of the firm, which is the revenue that the firm brings in each year. I'm not talking about dollars received. I'm talking about revenue earned. There's a real difference between the two. For the sake of my approach, for the sake of the world that I live in, for the sake of the world that I do work in, I say in a general way of explaining it simply, accounting is the realm of dollars received and dollars paid out, leaving you with a tax liability to the government. Either you have one or you don't have one. Whatever is left over is something that you're going to have to pay taxes on unless you choose to distribute it all before you have to pay the taxes and let someone else pay the taxes, meaning you give out money to yourself and to your staff as bonuses. The realm of financial management is only dealing with what you've earned. This is the time you spent, and it's what's created the earned revenue for your firm. In financial parlance, the word net operating revenue is the key term because it's those dollars that are left that your firm can spend and a certain amount of the money we're going to earn as a profit, which we hope will be at least 20% after paying all salaries and all expenses and all consultants and all vendors. So working on that front end is the most important part of it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in that respect, the net operating revenue deals with the three basic elements, that is direct labor, overhead, and profit. Those are the three things that you're going to need to know about. Well, those components of net operating revenue take on different forms, and they are distributed differently throughout the profit loss statement. Essentially, if you thought about it, when you look at a profit loss statement, you can pick these three categories up really easily. They show you that in an average firm across the board, the ratio between those three things looks like you spend about 30% of it on direct labor. Another 60% goes to paying overhead expenses. So what does that leave you? That leaves you with a paltry 10% as a profit. So here, the goal is to enhance that 10%. Well, where do you think that's going to come from? Well, there are two places. The two things that we just talked about, direct labor and overhead expenses. The direct labor can be controlled by establishing a project fee budget, which can be controlled by understanding what your overhead rate is then creating a billing rate that has a built-in profitability to it and a schedule that makes sense to do these kinds of things that have to be done within the scope of the services on the contract to deliver the project from the beginning to the end and make the product what you wanted. If you spend more than 30%, if that's what you budgeted, you're going to lose money. Why? Because you're spending more money to pay somebody to do the thing that wasn't intended. It's got to come from somewhere, and it comes from your profitability. So if you can reduce your direct labor to less than 30%, you might create a greater profitability. Now, there's not a whole lot of wiggle room in that number. The acceptable range for a total direct labor as a percentage of net operating revenue is between 28 and 32%. So where's the best place to earn more profit? It's in that big hulk of money called 60% that goes for overhead expenses. Well, I can say this. If you can save a dollar of overhead expense, you'll create a dollar of profit. It's that simple. 
find a way to reduce 60% and increase the profit to 20%, which means you've got to get your overhead down to 50% to get a 20% profit if your direct labor stays at 30%. Got it. So just to refresh here, last time we did talk about, well, actually this time we just finished talking about what goes into the overhead number. And some of the things were the payroll taxes, workers' compensation, and then, of course, the indirect labor costs. Right. Then all of the operational costs of keeping a firm running, your rent, your telephone. Utilities, rent, right. Yep. Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, Steve, if a firm is looking at their overhead rate and they want to reduce that overhead, what's the low-hanging fruit there in terms of reducing that big 60, 60% number? Where's the first place you start when you want to turn some of that overhead into profit? Well, you become aware of what you're spending. Mm -hmm. If you don't know what you're spending, you can't reduce it. So the first place is where I almost begin with my clients. My work, when I get started with a new client, I have one goal in mind. My goal is to primarily to work with the client and help them achieve their actual goals for their firm so they'll attain the success that they perceived and have a vision for. If I can accomplish that, then I'll consider my efforts to be successful. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, over the last 29 years, my work has encompassed the broadest range of any kind of business operations within a firm for that which relates, except for that which relates to design management and marketing strategy, because I don't do either one of those things. So in this process over this long 20-year journey, without exception, I have found that my initial work will always relate to somehow re identifying the opportunity financial management system for the firm and the resources that are required to get the best results from it. So it almost always goes back to something to do with money and how to better control it, better manage it, and how to get an enhanced amount of money in the profit side of it. Okay, so I'm a, let's say I'm a, I'm a firm principal and I'm looking to reduce my overhead. Can you give me one or two examples of where we can start? Well, okay, I'm going to start with the direct labor because even though there's not a lot of margin to attack, I think it's a key place. A lot of firms cannot attain this range that I suggested of 28 to 32 percent of net operating revenue for the direct labor. The reason they don't have success in doing that is threefold. One, many of them don't even know that there is such a range that they should be in. Two, they don't know how to calculate that range because they don't have the right tools to do so. And then three, they don't have any kind of game plan for how to run a project called a project fee budget. If they do have a project fee budget, it gets set aside once the projects have started. So I'm going to go back to a very basic process that has to do with understanding when you receive a request for a proposal from a client. They're asking you to come up with a fee proposal. Well, all too, often, all too often I have witnessed this. I've experienced this in my own career, that working for firms, even in the large firm that I worked for for 11 and a half years, the fee is developed on the basis of, well, we did something like this last year or two years ago. It was, an inc it was in this ballpark, and we did it really well, so let's just make this fee this, that, that fee plus an increase of X percent. They take the easy way out. They take what I call the lazy way out. Okay, that's, that's a choice. That's a business decision. I'm not going to be judgmental about that. I don't think it's the right way to go. I don't think it's in their best interest to do that. But that's a decision that someone makes that's in charge. The best process is, to, is for every single project to sit down and do a project budget. That entails understanding what the scope of work is and how many kinds of tasks were involved in each piece of the scope of the work and then assigning a number of hours to accomplish those tasks. Then assigning an individual or individuals who are required to be involved in those tasks and what their billing rate is, or basically their break-even rate is, to establish what the cost will be to deliver that project they've identified, and then put the 20% on top of that, or take it, divide it by 80%, and come up with 20% for the built-in profit that's your fee. Mm -hmm. Well, even in those firms that may do all that, that's absolute, that are absolutely pristine and delivered and right on target and doing all of those things, some of them may send that fee proposal out and never look at it again during the course of the project. It doesn't become the baseline for their operation on the project. It's just a way of getting a fee. So if they don't manage it well, if they don't monitor it in respect to that profit that the project fee budget stated, so they wind up getting, uh, again, what they get. This is a place we can save money. 
that 28 to 32 percent is not some wild guess of what you ought to be at. It's an efficient range. If you remain in that efficient range, you're going to get a project done. You're going to get your targeted profitability and reduce the amount of expense you're going to to uh, have as a cost. Therein lies a whole range of things that have to do with the understanding your employees and how they function, how they operate, and why I feel so strongly about this whole thing about employee retention and investing time to develop and build them up and teach them how to do things properly and give them the information they need to succeed instead of fail. Left to their own devices, they'll do the best they can, no question about it. They're all professionals, but they don't understand. They don't understand some of the things that could be they could be doing or what they should be doing. So they go off the rails and they spend money that was never intended to be spent. But if they don't know what you told them, if, if how many budgets are shared with the staff, how many budgets have been given to the staff, whether it's in dollars or hours, you have this as your project. This is your number of hours you have to complete it for us to make the profit margin that we established for this project, which is 20%. Your job is to make this project come in at 20%. These are the hours you have to management. Now, that's a directive that's locked in stone. Yes, it's locked in stone as a fee, but at that point, you haven't already discussed this. You've already discussed this with your project manager who's going to manage a project and got their fee back to see if your number is realistic in terms of your estimated hours of doing a project. You're already at a loss. You're already at a disadvantage mm -hmm. because you're doing it after the fact. So it's inclusive. It's a collaborative process with all of the right people involved in the decision-making process, and then one person makes the final decision about what it needs to be. Yes. Then that person that makes the decision should be held accountable for having made that decision, beneficial or not beneficial to the firm. So that locks in this whole culture of accountability. Each person there under becomes accountable for their performance under that game plan that's been established and carrying it out and managing it and monitoring it so everybody succeeds. So an architecture has a project fee budget. What suggestions do you have for encouraging stewardship or a sense of ownership in terms of meeting that project fee budget? Well, again, in my world, if you're living in a culture of accountability, then you already know because it's been established and it's been communicated to everybody clearly, openly, and so everybody understands that you're going to share in the profit of this firm somehow, some way. Some firms set up profit-sharing plans. My problem with profit-sharing plans is not that everybody should get the same amount of money because not everybody contributes to the same level. So why would the highest performer be satisfied getting the same amount of money as the lowest performer as a profit share or as a bonus? But that's what happens. So you've got to be able to let them know that this is what's going to happen in this program. You contribute to this program. We will evaluate your contribution. We'll sit down with you and, and talk to you about it, and we'll come up with a reward, a compensation for you because you've contributed to it. If I have the ability to control my financial destiny by working more effectively, more efficiently, working smarter instead of harder, understanding what's expected of me, what's the criteria to work with, I'm going to do the best possible job I can do so I can make the best possible return on my invested time. It works like a stimulator, a motivator, if you will, for those who see it as well as which they will benefit. I said some people are not motivated by money. Okay, well... Maybe you do such a great job, you're now going to be promoted to the next level up. You're no longer a project architect. Now you're going to be a project manager. You're no longer a project manager. Now you're going to be a project director. You're no longer a project director. Now you're going to be the next level up. You're going to be appointed as an officer of the firm. You become a principal or become a partner, a junior partner. I mean, associate principal, whatever the titles are. Their incentives to doing a better job that's certainly clearly delineated and explained to you in advance. So you're creating an environment in which everybody wants to do the best possible job because you've answered the question, what's in it for me? Steve, in a, in a practical application, how would a firm go about structuring a compensation plan? You mentioned that it should be individual and tailored to the person and there should be a dialogue with staff members to see what their hot buttons are so you can know what incentives they want. How do you translate that into the process of then deciding who gets more, who gets less of the so-called profit shares? 
Okay, I, I want to make a distinction right now. <clears throat> you know, in my opinion, my way of thinking and seeing is that performance reviews do not automatically lead to salary increases or for a sizable bonus or advancement. Yes. There's simply a way of letting you know how you did in the last 12 months relative to the goals you set in these last 12 months and what are going to be the new goals we're going to set for the next 12 months so you can do as well or better than you did for the past 12 months. Once you have this performance review, the answer from those things will be a contribution to the decision-making process about how this decision is made about who gets what and how much. It isn't necessarily discussed with the individual. Now you're going to get 15% or you're going to get X percent. That's not discussed in a performance review. It has no place in a performance review. It could come from a discussion after the fact once the decision was made to sit down and explain it to them. This is the outcome of your performance in the last year. We're going to do a distribution of profit through bonuses. There are going to be performance bonuses, and as you know, that's our policy. We do performance bonuses. So your performance bonus has been rated as such, which means that you're going to be in the upper X percent of the staff entitling you to, based on your salary, a percentage of bonus equal to X amount of dollars. And the same thing, through the, the same thing goes through for the salary. So it's policy, it's formula, it's an absolute established methodology for coming up with this. It's decided by the key people in the firm and then maybe some of the key staff members as well as principals, not just the principals. Excellent. It's been a very good conversation, Steve. Well, thanks. Do you have anything that you felt like you wanted to add to the conversation before we finish up, something that maybe we didn't hit on as much as you would like or another topic that you feel is important? I'll tell you what I'd like to say. I would hope that my comments are not taken as criticism of my colleagues. I, I don't criticize my colleagues, and I don't judge my colleagues. I'm just aware of the things that I would like for them to learn and to know that would be beneficial to me. It's what my consulting practice is all about. It's what my focus is. I come to my business with a servant's heart to do what it takes to help my clients succeed and achieve the successes for their firm. But I'm never going to tell a client something they want to hear. I'm only going to tell them what they need to know. What they do with that information is up to them, and I'll accept their answer, and I'll accept their decision. I'm not being critical in any way. I'm just simply so passionate about the reasons why we as a profession should be doing so much better than we are. It has to do with the education about the things we're engaged in or in the things that we need to be engaged in that we're not engaged in because we don't know any better. Steve, if people want to find out more about how you work and how to get a hold of you, where should they go? Well, that's an interesting question. I'm in the process of creating a brand new website because my website is 15 years old and it's woefully out of date. A lot of information about me is out of date. Even the contact information is out of date because I moved six months ago to the Austin area. So if in your posting of this, you might be able to include my information, I'm willing to have you do that. It's just fine with me. Okay, I'll do that. I, I think you have that information, and we can talk about this after the fact to make sure that you have the right information about it to go. But I'm delighted to hear from anybody that has comments or a critique of these things or has an alternate proposal approach to the things that I've discussed. I'm wide open, I'm flexible, I'm listening to whatever they have to say, and I'm just delighted to be able to engage in a conversation about these subjects because it's my passion. Well, I can tell. Steve, thanks for spreading this, this knowledge and spreading this information. Your vast experience is very clear, and you present it in a very succinct manner. Well, thanks. That's very kind of you. Steve, thank you for being on the Business of Architecture. And that's a wrap for another show about the business of architecture. To get more resources about how you as an architect can raise your fees, land the projects you love to work on, and get the time in your day back, join the members-only Business of Architecture Insider list for free by going to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash free. Enter your best email address there, and I will send you instant access to free resources, including my book, Social Media for Architects. If you'd like to discuss a thought or insight from today's show, visit businessofarchitecture.com slash podcast. On that page, you'll also find my notes from today's show and the action items I took away from our conversation. Until next week, keep rocking 
and go conquer the world. views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help architects conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5. Do it anyway. And that's a wrap.